and I think we will get started. Um, so welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us um, from literally from across the world. We've got everybody joining us from everywhere, which is really, really lovely to see. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Katie Steingold. Um, I'm the events manager for uh, the International Quality Awards and its new home of Quality Live. Um, so um, I'm kind of the lead contact at the CQI. So if you do have any sort of follow up questions or need any support with your application, um, I'll be the person at the other end of the email address um, helping you out. So hello and nice to, to see you all here. Um, but I'm going to hand over to um, Estelle Clark, who is the Chief Judge of the International Quality Awards and has been since its inception. Um, so if anybody is the person to tell you how to how to apply and why it's important that you do, um, Estelle is the absolute um, expert um, and will we'll guide you through the process. So Estelle, over to you. Uh, thank you, Katie. And uh, I'd just like to add my hellos to those of Katie and to everyone who's uh, wished us Happy New Year, Happy New Year to you, to, to you too. Uh, so I have about a, a dozen slides to go through, um, but that's only going to take just over half of the time of the webinar. I want to allow lots of time at the end for people to ask questions. Uh, and, and I'm sure there will be many then, there always are. Um, so I'm sorry to just interject for one second, but I did mean to say we do have, as well as the chat function, you'll see at the bottom, um, should be at the bottom of most of your screens, there's a Q&A function. Yes. So if you can pop your questions in there to make sure that we see the questions, um, then we'll address those when Estelle gets to them. Thank uh, you. Yes, and um, what we did last time is if, they, if we are unable to get answers, time to answer all of the questions during the webinar, um, we, I will write an answer and we can put it up on the, uh, on the, on the website so that everything that you ask uh, will, get, will get covered. Uh, so I'm Estelle Clark. As Katie said, I've been the head judge for the International Quality Awards since their inception. And so this is year six for us. I'm very, very happy that they continue to be well supported and indeed better supported every year than the, the previous year. Uh, why am I head judge? Um, I've had spent a long time as a quality manager, quality director, working in a number of different countries and a number of different sectors. I was the chairman of the Charter Quality Institute um, around 2012 to 2015. I was then head of profession for a, a, a number of years uh, until the time that I stood aside from that in order to enable me uh, to be the judge. Uh, and in a previous um, life and at a, a many, many years ago, I was actually the winner of uh, Quality Professional um, back in 2000 and, uh, 2007. Um, so K Katie, can you turn the, the slide for me, please? So the, the purpose of the webinar, I'm going to talk to you about this very quickly because you will have, oh, hello, Ali, nice to see you back. Um, by, yes, the purpose of the webinar, which you will have seen on the website, is to make sure that you're clear about the benefits of entering the awards, or what it is you have to do to enter, so the entry process, what the judging process is, is uh, what the judging process is. Um, a bit that I think is probably really interesting to you is what are the judges looking for, so a little bit of insider information on that um, and then we're going to spend a bit of time looking at which award is the right one or which awards are the right ones for you um, if you're at a point where you're not quite sure yet which uh, which category it is that you would uh, like to enter so this is these are the objectives and the agenda is going to follow through in this sequence uh, so you should uh, be able to easily understand where we are uh, next slide please so wh why do it? Um, I think I'll start off by saying that I don't know anyone who's entered who didn't think that it was a great thing for them to do. Um, so I haven't had anyone come to me and say I've entered and, and boy, I wish I didn't, I hadn't bothered. Uh, so just take it that over the hundreds of entries we've had, people have found this to be a useful exercise. I, to start with, you create a really powerful description, your best description, the description you think that is going to present the best view of what it is that either you or your team or your organization delivers in relation to a quality approach. Um, now, you can use that in a number of different ways, as well as for, the entry, for entering the awards. When I was a quality professional, 
I quite often found it really hard to explain to my friends what it is that I did. Um, well, ask them to read your submission. You can use this as a way of explaining to your boss what you do um, so that they can um, recognize you more. You can use it with your team. You can, of course, use elements of, or all of what you use on social media. You can use it potentially on your LinkedIn profile uh, as a way of explaining what you do. And I think the, the benefit of sitting down and taking a little bit of time to write 1500 words about how you, your team or your organization delivers a quality approach is itself really useful. Um, you can get feedback as a result of entering. So there's feedback to everyone. Um, now, clearly, we we expect to have over you know, a hundred plus many more entries. Um, so we are not going to provide personalized feedback to everyone, but we will provide feedback as a result of my taking speaking to each of the judges and we produce a two, three page report about the general things that we find from all of the entries, the things that people do well, the things that people don't do well. And therefore, you can then see what is missing and you could see how to improve in order to get um, a better chance of being a finalist in, a, in, in the years to come. But everyone who is a finalist, and I think that was 21 people, uh, 21 people, teams or organizations in 2022, all of the finalists, um, based on the fact that they are making a submission and having an interview, will get personalized feedback. A four page report formed from the views of the three panel judges uh, and myself. And I know that organizations, teams and individuals have used that not only to mean that they can re-enter the awards, but also to benefit from your peers, um, other people in your industry, other people in, in, in your profession rather, letting you know what they think about uh, what it is you're doing, um, such that you can use that as feedback and sort of, if you like, coaching, mentoring, so that you can get improved, uh, you can improve. Um, and you will also get recognition um, as a result of um, entering, talking to your team, your friends, your et cetera. But if you're a finalist, you'll get recognition in terms of publicity. And I will talk about that a little bit more later. Next slide, please. So moving on, uh, the process of entering, what I suggest you do is first of all, review the criteria for each of the different categories. They are all subtly different. Um, and make sure then that you select the category or categories that are most appropriate and going to give you the best chance of, of doing well. Then what you'll need to do is compile the evidence so that you can write your submission. We're going to ask you to write 1500 words and we're going to ask you to provide some um, backup information on slides. So get everything together and then complete your application using the online awards portal. The, the reason we have a portal, it's a benefit to the people who are entering. Uh, you can go on any number of times, um, look at what it is that you've done, save what it is you've done, and then only when you're happy with the entirety do you need to press submit, and that will come through to the CQI and to the judges. But obviously, it's really helpful to the judges. It's a, it's a level playing field. Everyone is ap applied in exactly the same way. Everyone's submission is going to look the same and the judges will write their review comments on the online uh, portal. So I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about the judging process, but once we've looked at all of the entries and reviewed them, we will then um, decide who, our final, who the finalists are. Uh, and at that point in time, we provide feedback to the non-finalists in the way that I said, the generalized feedback. And we tell those people who are finalists that they are. Um, and if you're a finalist, we will then invite you to interview. And as I said, if you attend the interview um, after that, you will receive personalized feedback. Um, next slide, please. So this is a screenshot from the awards platform. And the awards platform is different in 2023 from the one that we used previously. Um, and so I'm going to just ask Katie to talk about this for a moment uh, because she's more uh, currently more au fait with this than I am. 
Um, so it's a very straightforward platform to use. It's very similar um, to the platform that we have used in previous years. So if you are applying this year and you've applied, applied in previous years, it may look slightly different, but the questions and the, um, and the process are all pretty similar to what you will be used to. Um, the platform link is on our website, um, which is uh, quality.org forward slash IQA23. We'll pop that link in the chat um, for you as well so that it's there. Um, and then you can link through to the portal um, from that web page. Um, and you simply log on to the website. Um, it will ask you to set up a username and password, which is you know pretty standard these days. Um, and then it will take you through the process. So there will be the guidelines um, available for you to read through for the specific award or awards that you're looking to apply to. Um, it will also link to the application guide that we have put together um, this year and in previous years, which is also available from the CQI website. Again, we can pop a link to the application guide in the chat for you all um, just now so that you can have a look at that. Um, and it will just guide you through the process. Um, it's a very simple um, web form. Uh, the questions are all the questions that's included in the um, application guide um, and that those of you who have applied previously will be familiar with and um, they should be fairly straightforward and, and straightforward to understand. But there's also details there. So if you do have any questions as you're going through the application process, you're welcome to get in touch with us um, and we can help guide you through the best that we can. Uh, thank you, Katie. Can we have the next slide, please? So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the process of judging. Um, this is something that you won't necessarily find uh, in, in so much detail um, if you look at the material. Uh, so for each of the six categories, um, I put in place a panel of three judges. Those three judges are different for each of the categories. So that means that I'm finding 18 judges in total. And for each of the categories, there are at least two subject matter experts. There may be three subject matter experts. Um, in some of the categories, I also include a previous year's winner. Uh, I think that's quite a, a, a nice thing to, uh, to do. Um, as of this morning, I have 16 of the 18 judges in place uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the awards for this year. Um, so you can trust me that I'll have everyone in place by the, uh, the time that it's, it's needed. <coughs> Excuse me. So once the um, award entry period closes and it's no longer possible for you to make an entry, we send uh, links to each of the judges for each of the categories so that they can read, assess and mark all of the applications that are in their category. Um, five of the six categories, the marks are out of 100. Uh, they, they score that using the platform that you have just, uh, just seen. And they do that individually. Uh, I think there's a great benefit um, in starting off with everyone having an individual view, and then we come together. Uh, and that way, there's no way that um, one person can unduly influence the others. Everyone has got their views down on paper first. Um, I then share a consensus meeting six of them, one for each of the categories where we, uh, I work with each of the three judges. And as a res the, the purpose of the consensus meeting is that by the end of the meeting, we have selected two, three or four finalists. Um, so we're coming into that meeting with um, all of the scores, all of the views, we will have read each other's uh, material in advance. Uh, and then we will talk through and uh, as a result of that, align on the two, three or four finalists. If we need more than one session in order to cover all the material, we will, we will have it. Um, why the difference between two, three or four? It's simply that um, we are scoring these, uh, your entries. If I found that in a particular category, I had two people scoring 80 and two people scoring 78, Let's, um, then I'm not going to want to try cho to choose three when actually four people's marks are all much the, uh, the same as each other. However, it may be that there's a big gap between two people and the, and the, the rest, in which case we would have two. Um, and so it's, it's purely to make sure that we don't disadvantage anyone um, and cut the line at a point that is almost arbitrary. Um, I had no idea that that was going to happen. I'm going to ignore it um, and hope that someone goes away. Um, 
At the end of the consensus meeting, as I said this week, we, the judges tell the Charter Quality Institute um, uh, who the finalists are. They will then invite them to interview. And then we run online interviews with the panel of judges and each finalist individually. Uh, the, the interview lasts between an hour and an hour and a quarter. Uh, and I also join the, uh, join the interview. I've sat in every interview in every category in every year. Um, and it's my way of making sure that I can observe that the process is working. But it's also because I'm the person who's going to be writing the, uh, the personalized feedback report. Uh, and consequently, I'm just going to get rid of that person. Don't please forgive me. Thank you. The unexpected parcel delivery. Um, yes, so I um, I will uh, provide the feedback and we'll sit through each of the uh, each of the interviews. And at the end of the interviewing, all of the finalists in any one of the categories, we will make a decision on the winner. Um, and so at the end of an interview day, say for emerging talent, um, I will inform the Charter Quality Institute of whom the winner is. Uh, they will be able to um, get the trophies built or engraved or whatever. Uh, and then we keep silent. Uh, and there's no communication about the decision of the winner until the day of the awards. Next slide, please. Uh, probably even more interestingly than the... Um, uh, what the judging process is, I thought you might be interested to um, get my view of what the judges are looking for with a little bit more of my personal insight than you will find in the application guide. So first of all, I would say you do need to read the criteria uh, really carefully and you need to know that you're going to be able to answer all of the criteria. Um, if, we're, if we're taking an award with 100 points available, and five criteria that you need to answer, there's going to be 20 criteria each. If you can only answer four of them, you're not going to be eligible to get any marks for the fifth criterion. Uh, and that's really gonna mean that you, you are un, you know, exceedingly unlikely to get to the point of being a finalist. We have had people who've entered categories um, and have only put text in three of the five, uh, to, uh, in, in text in, in response to three of the five questions. If you find that that's what you're likely to do, you are not going to get to be a, to be a finalist and there really isn't any point. I think it's it, what it means is that category isn't the right category for you. Secondly, make sure that the answers to all of the questions tell a story. This isn't about getting somebody to write a section on context and someone to write a section on governance and someone to write a, a, a section on assurance, et cetera, and then putting them all together. We have seen many, many applications, which is clearly a result of a team, and that's fine. But if you don't have somebody who's reading the entirety of it, you'll find that there's going to be gaps and equally, we've seen many instances where the same comment has been made in respect to three or four of the questions. You can't get more marks by saying the same thing a number of different a number, in a number of different places. Uh, and given that there are only 1500 words available to you, it's wasting space that you could use uh, for, other, uh, for other things. It's also important that your story is about you or your team or your organization. It's not about the theory. Um, so on quality organization of the year, um, the, the marking is based on um, ISO 9004. And we have had people who've pasted large parts of ISO 9004 standard into the text. There's not going to be any marks for your telling us what we already know are the criteria that we're looking against. You have. It's all about how you are providing a quality approach using those criteria and achieving quality results, answering all those criteria. Think about balance between the questions. As I said, there's um, 20 points available to each of the questions, um, 10 for your approach, 10 for your answer. But, sorry, 10 for your approach, 10 for your results. 
Um, consequently, if you're going to take your 1500 words and use a thousand of them in answer to the first question, it's likely that you won't have enough words left over to provide a complete answer for the others. And it won't mean that you'll get more marks for the first question where you put more of your text. You really need to balance it pretty, pretty evenly. Not exactly, but if you find you've got twice as many words in answer to one question, I think you probably need to just go back and check that um, that that, is, that that works. So that's that's the um, I've covered the balance between the questions and the allocation of the the text. You need to make sure that you have evidence for everything in your approach. Um, so we're looking for what do you do and what are the results of what you do? So how do you know that what it is you've chosen to do works and you show us that it works by giving us your results? If you don't give us any results, then we don't know that your approach is the right one. And it isn't only that you might lose, you will lose marks in relation to your results. You may well also lose marks in relation to your approach if we, if we really don't understand why you chose it. Uh, you need to be looked at explaining why the approach you have led to the results you got and therefore why that approach is the, the best one for you. And one of the ways we help you um, provide us with that evidence is we give you the opportunity to provide some slides in addition to the 1500 words. And the reason we provide, uh, give you the opportunity of putting in um, half a dozen or so slides is so that you can add to your story and you can add to your opportunity to score marks. Um, there is a rule that, they, that the, the, the slide must be readable. Um, you can't just put a slide in with a hundred different uh, hyperlinks to, to places on the internet. We need to be able to read the slide. Um, we limit the amount of data such that everyone has got an equal chance. So we say that uh, keep your data, keep your information on the slide. But I really strongly suggest that you provide us with, with, um, with evidence that you can put here uh, results, you can put graphs, um, you can chart things. There have been many instances where people have used all of the slides, uh, for example, on Quality Professional, to provide photographs um, of your um, uh, photographs of your achievements. That's interesting, but there aren't any marks for photographs of your achievements in the sense of uh, the fact we don't need to see your certificate as being a chartered quality professional. Uh, we don't need to see a photograph of you getting your, your degree. Um, we don't even really need a photograph of you with your team on one of the team awards. I mean, maybe use one slide to give us an appreciation of who you are. But you want to use your slides in order to help you score on the results, is my suggestion. And if there's one thing that we find that people don't really understand is that we are expecting to see some, some data, some results. And it's obviously much easier to put that on a slide than it is to try to summarize it within your words. Uh, and the final thing in terms of what the judging is they're looking for is in relation to the interview. What we are doing in the interview is we're taking the opportunity of asking you about your submission. We want to verify some of the things. We want to uh, challenge some of the things you've said. We might ask for further insight. So it's perfectly okay during the interview to prov be providing us with more granular, more detail, absolutely fine. But what we can't have an interview is an entirely different story. Um, and there have been some instances where I think people have thought, oh, I know we said this on the submission, but it might have been better if we presented it in a different way or told a, a, a completely different insight. Um, and, and it shouldn't be that. It should be a discussion around the detail behind your submission. One more thing other than what is I've put on the slide here um, is if you're going to use jargon, uh, please somewhere in the submission tell us what it means. Um, it may be a three letter acronym that is very common in your sector, um, but might not mean anything to people not working in your sector, or even worse, and this has happened, might mean something different to people not working in your sector. Um, and again, 
um, therefore leading us to misunderstand what it is that you're you're writing. Uh, and under that's just a, a waste of everyone's time and, and a real shame. So tell us what it is that you you mean. Um, and not only in relation to acronyms, but if there are any technical jargon, uh, just make sure that you um, you cover what that off what that means for the judges. As I say, I have subject matter experts, but there's not necessarily a judge who's working in your sector. Next slide, please. So we have six categories. You'll have seen uh, these uh, uh, previously. Um, we have three of the categories are using the criteria of the CQI competency framework, context, governance, assurance, improvement, and leadership. Those categories are emerging talent, quality professional of the year, quality team of the year. Um, so if, if we start at the left-hand side of this slide, emerging talent, we were interested in how someone has used all elements of Seagale, but if it's someone who's young in their career, we expect that they will have done things as part of a team. We will expect that quite a lot of what you've been asked to do, um, the strategy for what you're doing has come from someone else. Um, so we don't expect you to have put in place the entirety of the quality approach. Um, and we understand that in relation to emerging talent. If we turn to quality professional of the year, we would expect that at least some, um, some elements of the approach have been put in place by you. Um, and it wouldn't be right to enter quality professional of the year if everything that you're doing is something that is something that you have inherited from someone else. Um, and then quality team of the year, again, using um, Seagale, but looking at how the quality team, the quality department works together uh, to deliver. Uh, and here it's really important that you tell us who the team is. Uh, so it might be the quality department in a particular location. It might be for a particular business stream. It might be for the organization as a whole. Uh, but you need to tell us how many people are in the team and what context the team is working uh, within. Obviously, if the team is three people, um, we're going to think that they need to have achieved maybe slightly less than if the team was 300 people. Uh, and we have had instances where the team has, has been multi-hundreds. So please help us um, be able to calibrate what a reasonable expectation is. Um, and then the moving to the right-hand side of this chart, quality organisation of the year is for the entirety of an organisation. Here, the uh, criteria are based on 9004. So the criteria for sustainable organisation. Um, but again, tell us what the organization includes, uh, whether or not you're including um, Estelle Clark Limited UK or Estelle Clark Limited globally, globally or Estelle Clark Limited um, Energy, um, whatever it is, uh, just so that we understand that. And here, one of the real differences is about sustainability uh, and how you make sure that the culture encourages a quality organization and a sustainable quality organization. And the question, the answers need to be more than just about processes and procedures. Uh, and then the final two categories, the two new categories that we introduced in 2022, both of which were amazingly uh, popular, um, dozens of entries for each, um, and consequently re um, uh, doing the uh, introducing, keeping them there for 2023. Uh, first of all, di digital innovation, where we're looking for uh, the way in which an organization has um, improved the performance of their business processes using quality management approach, but also using a digital means. Uh, and I think it's important here to say that we're not just looking for the whiz bangiest, the most exciting digital innovation that's out there. We're looking for a digital innovation that used quality management and where the selection of the technology had a quality approach underlying it. Uh, and it's a similar in terms of sustainability impact. We're looking for um, an organization that is able to indicate how they meet the needs of future generations um, and don't compromise the ability of future generations in relation to the way they manage the business in the present. But we're looking to understand how they do that using a quality approach with context assurance, le le um, learning and improvement, uh, rather than just an explanation of sustainability. And for all of them, 
Um, we really would like you to give us some indication, maybe in the leadership section, as to what makes you stand out from the crowd. Clearly, if I take the example of emerging talent, quality professional, quality team, I've already said you need to cover what you're doing in context, governance, assurance, improvement and leadership. So everyone's going to have that. Um, and what we need to know is what will make your entry stand out for the judges as opposed to everyone else who enters, such that you are the people or the person who gets chosen to come to interview. So just give us, even if it's one sentence, give us a little bit of magic dust. Next slide, please. Um, so let's assume that it's all worked, the magic dust was there and you've been um, invited to be a finalist. Uh, so you're invited to the interview. Um, and this slide says you can include other people. Let me just ex explain that. If you're in a category that is an entry that is involved many people as part of the entry, so a project in digital innovation um, um, or in sustainability impact or a quality team, quality organization, it doesn't seem to be fair that only one person can, uh, can participate in the interview. Uh, so you can choose to in include other people. Um, the only thing I would suggest is just think about the interviews uh, only an hour, hour and a quarter. Um, and if you've invited, I don't know, 10 people and they're all in different locations and we're managing transferring the, um, uh, the baton between uh, different places, just make sure that it makes, it makes sense. If it's an individual award, so emerging talent or quality professional, and then you solely will be asked questions and will answer questions during the interview. But if you would like someone to sit alongside you as support, then please feel free to, uh, to invite a friend. Um, so your, if uh, your name will be mentioned at the awards ceremony, there will be a, a roll of honor. And we will read out all of the finalists before we open the envelope as it, as it is and uh, name the winner. Uh, you will be prof profiled various ways by the CQI and the awards app on the uh, CQI website. Uh, if you win, you will be invited to collect your award uh, on the main stage. Uh, and we may interview or film you at the awards event. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, as you may be profiled in case studies or online articles for the CQI. Um, we've done that quite often in the past. And, and as I said now, many, many times, uh, after the award event, you will receive personalized feedback uh, from, the, uh, from the judges. Next slide, please. Right, so some key dates. First of all, a date that you may not be aware of yet and a new piece of the process. On Monday the 13th of January, we're running some drop-in sessions with me uh, where I'm available uh, for anyone who's got questions. It's a little bit like a clinic. Um, so at 9.30 uh, UK, um, there's a clinic for the individual categories, emerging talent and quality professional. And at four o'clock on the same day, UK, there's a clinic drop-in session uh, for the other categories, the team and organizational categories. Um, and we think that might be, uh, might be helpful. Uh, it's a couple of weeks away. You've had time to think about your entry. Maybe you're a little bit stuck. Maybe you've got a question. Um, it's just a way of, uh, of getting an answer. The deadline for applications is the 8th of March. Um, and then after the 8th of March, the judging process kicks in in, in full. There's the offline marking, the consensus calls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the uh, invites to the uh, finalists for uh, the interviews. And then the, the rah, rah the big day, Thursday, the 15th of June, the conference and the International Quality Awards winners at ceremony. Next slide, please, which I think tells you more about where that is and when that is. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So 15th of June, as I said, um, it's a day long event in 2023. Uh, the venue is a new one, um, even lovelier. Um, but please note those people who are going to be uh, attending uh, that it's not at the Connaught Rooms as, uh, as previously. But 133 Houndsditch is right in the centre of, uh, of London. And I think that's the last thing that I want to say before I open it to, to people to uh, for questions. 
Lovely. Thank you so much for that, that Estelle. It was um, always very informative um, and hopefully has answered a lot of questions already. Um, but we do have some time to go through um, questions now. So if we can just remind you to pop those into the Q&A box at the bottom rather than the chat, um, just to make sure that we see them mm -hmm. and we will get through as many as possible. Um, so the first thing that's come through, and it's come um, through a couple of times, and we have responded to it in the Q&A box, but just in case anybody else is also just wants clarity, is can you just explain, Estelle, what you mean when you say sea gale? Okay, yes. So for the um, emerging talent, the quality professional and quality team, when you start to write your submission, you'll see that we're asking you questions um, that are, are based on the um, Chartered Quality Institute's competency framework for quality professionals. And the competency framework has the mnemonic CGALE. CGALE stands for Context, Governance, Assurance, Improvement and Leadership. And what it basically means in relation to the, your submissions is we'd like you to start off by telling you the context of your organization, your team or yourself, what it is that you are tasked with doing within your organization and how you know that you are doing the things that your organization needs. We'll then ask you about governance. Um, so again, a little bit more about how you know that what you're doing are the, right, are the right things. What are the controls around the quality processes and practices that you have in place? We'll then ask you about assurance. Um, we'll ask you about the processes a little bit more, maybe about the measurement of those processes, any audit or review of those processes. Um, and then we'll ask you about improvements. So if you're finding that the things that you're doing um, need some improvement, revision, amendment, correction, what mechanisms do you, do you your team or your organizer, uh, do, yes, do you or your team use in order to make things better? Um, and then finally, we give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit more about your, your, you and your team in terms of leadership. Um, so how do you inspire? Um, how do you change the culture? Uh, how do you lead? Lovely. Thank you for that, Estelle. Um, and um, another one that has, has come up a couple of times, but just to be completely clear um, about whether or not people need to be a member to apply for, uh, for an award. Um, the, there is a requirement to be a, a CQI member um, for the entry to quality professional. Um, there isn't a requirement for uh, entry to emerging talent or any of the other awards this year, are there? No. No. So right. simply for quality professional, uh, you do need to be a chartered quality professional. And actually something that follows on quite nicely to that is, and I know that this is a question that's come up in previous years, is whether or not an applicant can apply for membership now at the time that they're going through the process to ensure that by the time the judging comes around, um, they are um, they do meet the requirements for the Quality Professional of the Year Award. So, yes, we have had this previously. And if you tell us that, um, that you are going to be able to make your submission to the awards and your submission to become a Chartered Quality Professional in the same period, um, then we will work hard to make sure that we can get that tied up so that you can, uh, you can qualify. Um, but what you won't be able to do is to enter um, and then sometime much later say, oh, by the way, I now want to become a, 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 become a member after we've actually marked and seen your entry. Lovely. Thank you for that. Um, another question that I know has come up in previous years, um, so definitely worth um, raising here, is about the coverage period for the award. So obviously the awards are on an annual cycle, um, but in terms of, I think this question is probably looking more particularly towards the evidence to support the, the approach. Yes. Um, is there kind of a time limit that, that the judges like to see? Does it have no. to be within the last year, six months, three no, months? No, no. It, it, I mean, I'd, ideally longer, so that's than that the more evidence there is the better the reason we don't set a um set this specifically is in recognition that sometimes people have entered and they've only been with an organization for 18 months or so um, and therefore they personally can't tell us any evidence of about the period from when they weren't part of that organization um, but if you've been part of an organization, part of a team for a long time, the project's been working for a long time, then the longer the evidence period, the, 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 the better it is. Uh, what I would say is that 
it's probably unlikely that you're going to be able to persuade us uh, that your approach has led to, uh, to sustainable results if you're giving us data for under a year. Um, you're just not going to have a, a, unless it's something you're measuring on a very, very frequent basis. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and one um, question that I know comes up an awful lot, so I will just um, say it now, is that there is no fee to enter the awards. The awards are free to enter. You can enter as many as you like, providing that you meet the criteria um, for the award. So we would um, suggest that you look at the application guide for that. Um, but there is no cost to um, to enter the awards. We know that some organisations do charge, but we don't. So, um, yes. so, yeah, so please do apply. And another question that um, kind of follows on from that is that, as we say, yes, you can apply for more than one award, um, providing you meet the criteria. So can I can I just add something to that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes. Katie, you can apply for more than one award as long as you meet the criteria, um, particularly in relation to those awards that are based on the CQI competency framework, emerging talent, quality professional and quality team. Please don't think that it's enough to just write exactly the same words and enter for all three of those uh, categories. Um, you need to tailor your entries to what it is we're looking for. And if we're looking for evidence that the team have made some achievements, then that needs to be different from evidence that it is that you made some achievements. Uh, I would also say, I think you need to question yourself quite uh, severely if you're thinking of entering both emerging talent and quality professional. We have had people who've done this. I think it's very hard to say on the one hand, I'm very new in my career and I'm under the guidance and leadership of someone else, whilst equally on a different form saying I led this. Um, and just think about what is uh, likely to be most acceptable, if you like. This, these two categories are the ones where I have most often had to go back to people and just challenge whether their entry was in the right place and maybe suggest that we moved something from one to the other. Um, so we have had people enter emerging talent on one occasion who was a university professor um, of quality management. And I just questioned, what are you waiting to emerge into? <laughs> so, um, but again, if you're unsure, um, then um, come to the drop-in uh, session on that and, and tell me your concern and I'll, and I'll help you unpick it uh, and we'll work out together which would be best. Lovely. Thank you, Estelle. Um, a couple of questions, um, which I think you covered a little bit earlier, but in case people have joined us later, it's just a reminder of how many finalists you tend to shortlist um, for each category and um, yeah, and the process of selecting the winner. Yes. Yes. So the um, number of finalists is going to be between two to four. Um, we can't have one finalist because then it's obviously who it's obvious who's won. Um, and any more than four feels to me that the judges haven't done a, an adequate job in relation to um, taking the long list of entries and creating the short list of finalists. The way we decide between the two to the four is um, based on the submissions of the three judges in conversation with my, myself. If we find that all three judges have got the same top three, and then there's a big gap between the marking of those top three and number four, then it's really clear we're going to be having three finalists. Um, if, however, um, it's it's slightly more complex um, and there are different people in the top uh, um, in the choices, I may think that it's more it's beneficial to invite an extra person in for interview rather than trying to cut the number of interviewees to three when there's a difference of opinion and we have the opportunity to invite more people and to understand um, through, through, uh, through questioning. There's also been a couple of occasions when, and I should probably have said this earlier, is that we work really hard to make sure that those, there's no detriment to anyone for whom English isn't your mother tongue um, and that we aren't looking for perfect English, we're looking for the best submission. Um, however, there have been times when I've thought that um, maybe something in a submission was unclear um, from someone who if English wasn't their mother tongue and that it would be a good idea to, uh, to offer that person opportunity to interview uh, where we could, uh, we, we maybe could understand better. 
Um, and so that this is at the gift of the judges and my myself, whether it's two, three or four, but two, three or four has always felt right with the entries that we've had so, so far. We do spend quite a long time in the consensus conversations uh, to make sure that the, uh, the, that the choices are the right ones. And if I may add to that as well, Estelle, it may also just be worth acknowledging that in the past, um, for interviews, we've also had interpreters um, present for people yes. for whom they would prefer to um, communicate through an interpreter. If uh, absolutely in fine. And if necessary, we can then sort of um, make the timing a little bit longer uh, in relation to that. So that, again, you're, that there's nothing to there's no detriment to you for having a, a, a translator there. Lovely. Um, a question here, which I will read out as it's written, um, which is, is CSR responsibility of the organisation favoured or is that something that is not needed to include? Um, I think that's your choice. Um, I mean, it, there's certainly no requirement that corporate social responsibility sits with the person making the submission. Um, I think it would be very important that we up in sustainability category that we understand how the entry um, if it's looking at a particular element of CSR and sustainability sits within the wider CSR um, strategy of the organization but we don't come in with any particular requirement any rules in relation to that and we recognize I think so thank you very much for this question we recognize particularly in relation to this category um, that this is an emerging field and people do things very differently from each other. Um, and we are interested in hugely in learning from what different organizations uh, do. And so please don't feel that we have one solution already in our minds. We don't. That's great. Thank you. Um, and one last question um, that um, looks like it's, it's kind of wrapping up here is um, what about ERCA grades? Are those recognized? Um, we don't have a um, specific category um, for uh, quality auditor or uh, uh, any longer. Um, so we did, we used, we did for a couple of years or maybe two, three years. Um, we had a, a, an auditor category um, for the perspective of the encouragement of people who are our core auditors. Um, that category wasn't, I'll be truthful here, that category wasn't hugely popular. What we found was that ERCA auditors were much more keen to put their entries into quality professional and show that they were more rounded in terms of what they did, rather than just saying we're entering a, an A, answering an A question, the A being assurance in, in my Seagale uh, context, governance, assurance, improvement and leadership. Um, and so we've we've talked through this through with many auditors um, and we firmly believe that an ERCA auditor can answer the context of their organisation and why their uh, auditor activity makes sense within that. They can talk about the governance in place in relation to audit and they can talk about the improvement in place in relation to audit and they can talk about their leadership style. Uh, and there's absolutely no reason why um, you shouldn't enter uh, on that on that basis. Um, and we see that the roles of uh, quality professionals who are auditors are equally important to quality professionals who may cover some slightly different activities. Fantastic. Well, I think that um, brings us nicely to an end. Um, hopefully we've covered um, as many of the questions as we can. Um, but like we say, if there is anything that you think of mm. um, between now and um, and the application deadline on the 8th of March, feel free to email us um, at internationalqualityawards at quality.org um, and we will do our best to respond to those. Yes, um, I'm very happy to. Katie and I are in conversation almost daily. <laughs> Um, and then just a reminder that we are um, introducing these drop-in sessions on the 30th of January, so you can book your slot on the um, CQI website. Um, so if you do have questions about your application, whether you've started it, whether you've yet to start it, um, do come along and you can put those questions to Estelle. Katie, I saw someone ask by the ch um, by a chat whether the recording is available. The recording will be available um, on our YouTube channel um, shortly after um, the webinar ends, and we will be sending out an email um, in the next day or two, which will include the link to the um, to the recording. Um, so yes, it will be available for you to refer back to. 
Um, otherwise, um, that just leaves me to say thank you so much to, firstly, to Estelle for this presentation. Thank you, thank you everyone. Um, Good luck. To everybody who has joined us from all over the, the globe, um, we really do appreciate you joining us here uh, this morning for us, but I appreciate it's uh, different time zones everywhere. Um, as we end this webinar, there will be a quick um, poll which will pop up for you to just let us know whether or, or not this has been useful for you or not. So please, please enter. take a moment to, to give us your feedback so that we um, we know um, what we can improve on if we run this webinar again. Thank you. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Um, good luck with your applications and we look forward to seeing them come through. Have a lovely day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Katie.